this is Professor Doyle Young. Uh, we're on uh, Chapter 9. Uh, this is a supplemental lecture um, related to this particular chapter. I might mention to you uh, in starting uh, that uh, if the other chapters were talking about um, the traits uh, of leaders, uh, their behaviors, how we assess them, what leadership is, uh, this chapter is sort of a turning point in the lecture, in the books, because now it's sort of uh, how I'd characterize uh, um, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, this is where um, the outcomes uh, of uh, leadership are most recognizable in terms of uh, creating um, an organization uh, that is um, effectively motivated with uh, high levels of satisfaction and uh, performance uh, is evident. So we're really talking about the basis for um, the outcomes, frankly, of uh, when leaders are performing or not performing. <clears throat> uh, the Gallup organization in the United States is probably one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, organization, a research organization around uh, statistics and uh, psychometry and testing and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> they have uh, made a statement in their research that if companies in the United States could get 3.7% 3, 3 more work out of each employee, the equivalent of essentially 18 minutes of work for each eight-hour shift, then the gross metric product in the United States would swell by $355 billion, twice the GDP of, uh, of Greece. So the ability to motivate others is a fundamental leadership skill and has strong connections to managerial incompetence. Uh, variation in work output very significantly as we can estimate with leaders and followers and that creating highly motivated and satisfied followers depends most of all on understanding others. So with uh, leadership ability comes uh, uh, we're back to the relational or human dynamics of the world that we operate in. And so uh, as we look at this topic, maybe it might be good to define them a little bit more before we move into some, some other elements, important uh, uh, elements in this chapter that I would like to emphasize. Uh, motivation is uh, defined as anything that provides direction, uh, intensity, uh, and persistence uh, to behavior. Anything that provides direction, intensity, and persistence to behavior. Uh, motivation is not necessarily directly observable, but it must be inferred from behavior. So if we, if we see people acting very motivated, uh, that's not to say that uh, they are motivated. They could just be busy. Um, the second definition is performance. Behaviors are directed towards the organization's mission or goals or the products and services resulting from those behaviors. So uh, performance are behaviors directed towards getting things done, towards helping the organization uh, discharge its responsibility for its mission, helping the organization uh, achieve the goals for products and services. Uh, job satisfaction is how much does one like a specific kind of job or work activity. And so we have three elements. They are motivation, performance, and job satisfaction. Um, we also know that in terms of understanding influencing motivation, that motivational theories are useful for certain kinds of situations. This chapter has several, and I'm going to be talking about one in particular a little bit later. Now, knowledge about different motivational theories helps us choose the right theory for a particular follower and situation. I would encourage you as uh, students to really uh, spend some time understanding the different theories of behavior in this, uh, this chapter. And I mean the motivating uh, models put forward motivational theories in this chapter. Um, and I use them. They're, they're very helpful for me as a manager leader, not only just a professor, in, uh, in, uh, in being effective at dealing with a, a varied, varied uh, kinds of situations um, uh, in an organization. 
So knowledge about these can really result in higher performance and more satisfied employees. It's a tool, if you will. Um, most performance problems, as a book uh, accurately states, can be attributed to unclear expectations, uh, skill deficits, or lack of skills in employees, uh, lack of resources, for example, equipment shortages, or a lack of motivation by the employees. <clears throat> so this it's very important to be able to understand in terms of problem solving uh, when, when leaders, when we as leaders, or as we look at leaders, uh, and help them articulate what's going on or as they look at situations to help them understand, for them to understand that there are complexities to why performance isn't happening, okay? I want to come back to, I think, in the earlier lectures, I've emphasized a particular point with leaders which is absolutely important to tee back up since we're on a chapter dealing with motivation, satisfaction, and performance. I'm going to make a statement that one of the primary jobs of a leader manager is to what I call coach for performance. Um, it's, um, the leader and manager is really at a m very important level um, uh, modeling the behaviors appropriate uh, for that organization. And um, people, as they're saying in leadership, people are always watching. Uh, is the leader manager exhibiting the kinds of behaviors consistent with the culture uh, and that um, end up in creating this motivating environment? Do, do people want to follow a leader? Uh, and we talked about in the last chapter, is the person trustworthy? So what I'd like to do is sort of maybe retitle some of what we're talking about in this chapter um, and take a different approach by uh, characterizing uh, uh, the lecture around the question of how we go about creating a high performance environment in organizations. And um, when we look at creating a high performance environment, I think it's important to discern for leaders and managers that environment when we say what are we creating? We're creating an environment for work unit or group effectiveness. You know, uh, we're back to the importance of the team development by leaders. And so each uh, activity that the leader does has got to be focused around creating uh, organizing work based on work units. And I'd like uh, to create just sort of um, what makes for a uh, healthy organizational environment or climate. And, um, and here are some characteristics uh, that you will not necessarily find in the book in this chapter, but they're sort of a summary of some of the research. Number one is um, there's a strong sense of identity throughout that work unit or those groups. When workers identify with the goals and mission of the organization, they're more likely to be motivated. And if an organization knows who they are, where they're going, their mission and their management is committed to these employees, they're likely to share that commitment. So number one, there's a strong sense of identity throughout the work unit or groups. Secondly, uh, importantly, especially today when we were talking earlier about the uh, hyper change uh, nature of the world, uh, there's openness to change. Change, uh, building change capacity in the organization. The capacity of the organization, again, to use change as a competitive weapon, weapon is extremely important today. Uh, with increased uh, environmental or external change in the organization, what we're seeing is um, cultures uh, themselves increasingly being strained to uh, abil in their ability to to uh, be change friendly and change seeking. If they're change averse, it produces a huge gap between the demands placed on the environment, uh, external the environment to the organization, and the ability of the culture, work unit, or group to respond to the changes that are necessary. So the second one is that group needs to be open to change and move positively in a direction 
of change, friendliness, and seeking uh, as um, led by the leader. Thirdly is we find a healthy organizational climate is there is broadly diffused authority. When workers have the uh, authority to act comparable to their job, they are highly motivated uh, as opposed to having to check in with management over each in particular decision. Fourthly, in terms of environment and climate building is there's a, ideas are evaluated on merit. Um, <clears throat> We have found through extensive work over the years as researchers and, and organizational uh, students, students of organizational work, that the organization uh, has to really have a, a ability to innovate and create at an important process level. That is, people are given the opportunity for input uh, to be part of and collaborate on the ideas that are surfaced and, and there is a process in place. So the, so the ideas that are brought forth, again, are evaluated by uh, merit. Most employees have good ideas on how to improve work. Number five is uh, in an organization with a healthy climate, a motivating, performance-driven climate, there's a strong sense of support. Uh, an organization that supports its employees, create the employees uh, support of the company for the company and each other. The employees who support each other is, is generated by behaviors of cooperation and helpfulness. Okay, so a strong sense of support. Number six, there are flexible organizational forms. By this, what is meant that there are organizational forms are utilitarian rather than historic or traditional. That is, the organization picks forms or processes that have a high utility, that they simply, they work. That organization who has a high sense of utility brings achievement rather than frustrating workers' attempts to bring about change. So the organization puts support and, and, and flexible support to, to work with individuals and work units and groups to meet them where they are and help them move along and achieve based on the needs of those groups or individuals. Number seven, there's an orientation to achievement more than procedures or ritual. Um, frankly, all cultures bring into the organizational performance dimension the things that we used to do. This is how we have done it in the past and by implication or assumption that the statement is that maybe this should work in the future, this should work. Well, that is not always the case. Uh, achievement produces satisfaction of needs and motivation to achieve more. Organizations that specify procedures how to do it often limit the creativity and development of the worker and to be more productive forms of work. So there's an artful blend between how we've done things in the past and how we can change processes or programs or techniques or methods to meet the, the, the changing demands placed on the environment and how we can do things better. Number eight, in organizations with good climates and performance focus, where there are satis high levels of satisfaction, uh, there is open communication. Communication improves the employee ability to do his or her job. Workers continually want to know more about the organization and so increased communication of the appropriate kind helps workers to feel in on things and they have information and knowledge and moving forward. Number nine, there are common understanding of the company's values and objectives. This is very critical as we were talking earlier in the previous lecture about corporate culture and values, we underscored the importance of leaders to operate from a system of values. And so we're uh, employees understand the values that the company espouses and the values that the leader is displaying, uh, then, then there's a higher level of achievement of objectives and a higher level of motivation. Number 10, uh, emphasis on and programs for the development of people. Uh, we have spoken, I have lectured a little bit on the importance of uh, creating a continuous learning organization. It is actually one of the key variables uh, identified in the research 
uh, going on worldwide ongoing research about the commitment to continuous learning. That is the development of employees in the organization to acquire the requisite competencies, that is the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be able to do a job. As technology shifts that increase with new technologies and software and so forth, then it's incumbent upon those learners to acquire the skills to be able to operate machinery uh, and so forth. So there needs to be an emphasis on the development of people. Personal development, job development, career planning, and training are significant areas for the workers to, uh, to be more productive, master his or her job, and achieve um, organizational objectives. Number 11, um, in many organizations, meetings are the way to accomplish um, agreed upon goals. There are increasingly in the world, we're finding just lots and lots of meetings. And so what we'd like to do is propose in the research here that meetings, number 11, are oriented primarily to problem solving. So the meetings have a meeting purpose, they're very focused to meeting outcomes, uh, and people come into the meeting uh, prepared. Meetings, we know, can be demoralizing and waste resources. So problem solving, which involves people, is a primary motive for meetings. Number 12, uh, we would characterize as broad content in individual jobs. That is, some employees prefer to have jobs that are challenging, and allow for variety, development of new skills, and personal responsibilities. These are all key motivators. And so are the people in groups, individuals, have jobs that are challenging for them? This is an important part of matching the abilities of people to the jobs that they are doing. Lastly, in terms of creating uh, motivating environments high performance environments, number 13 is that the organizations set high performance standards. Performance standard is defined as what condition or conditions exist when the job is done right. So performance standards, the research shows that performance standards indicates that people are motivated to do better work when their standards are high and here is the key achievable. So as you get into this chapter, um, we will, you know, you will learn um, a lot about these different theories that are going on, different approaches. One in particular, in closing, I'd like to leave you with is the uh, focus on Hertzberg's theory of uh, what he called hygiene factors or motivators versus satisfiers. I think that's, let's see here, that would be page the latter part of that chapter, and I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about that because I think it's uh, a critical, not that the others aren't critical, but this one has, it has a really a critical um, element to it in terms of understanding these. It's figure 9.7, uh, page 421 in your book, and let me sort of summarize it for you as, um, as uh, this way. Uh, Hertzberg proposed a two-factor system. Um, he, he was referencing as motivators versus satisfiers, or the book references as hygienes, H-Y-G-I-E-N-E-S. And um, essentially put, what Hertzberg said, that there's two, there's two classes to, um, to, these, uh, to motivators versus satisfiers. So on page 420, he talks about those. Um, motivators would be such things as uh, 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 the opportunity for achievement, the opportunity for recognition, the opportunity for the work itself, the work is satisfying, uh, people like the work, they enjoy their work, uh, there's opportunity for take responsibility by the individual, and there's opportunity for advancement and growth. Uh, again, these are characterized by Hertzberg as motivators uh, for individuals. Now, to take the flip side, uh, he calls these hygiene factors, or what I call satisfiers. Uh, these are uh, uh, the ability of the person to have proper supervision, uh, the uh, working conditions the person is working in, um, uh, the uh, 
presence of co-workers, uh, you know, people that they enjoy working with, there's proper pay for the job, there's the policies and procedures that outlines the context from which people work within, and then there's job security. So here, here is what Hertzberg is, is saying sort of as a big picture view of the trade-off between hygiene factors and motivators, and that is this, that people uh, are motivated, uh, are baseline, people need these factors, the hygiene factors are satisfiers for them to be motivated. Let me say that again, that these basic or hygiene factors must be, must be present in the job for people to be, uh, provide the basis for motivation. Now the second level to this is those factors that increase, sustain motivation for those people. And those are the ones that he calls the motivators, the ones we, we just went over. So what, what Hertzberg is implying here is you can't have a motivated group of people or individuals unless you have these satisfiers or hygiene factors operating. Uh, occasionally I'll get a call I work with a client that wants to motivate a workforce uh, or individuals, but they have not attended to the hygiene factors. And, and so let's flip it around. The absence of a hygiene or um, satisfier leads to demotivation. So in, in the strictest sense, according to Hertzberg, you cannot motivate people unless you have the, base, the, basic, the basic hygiene or satisfiers, and then the absence of one of those can be motivating. So people, according to Hertzberg, are really not interested in hearing about how you're going to motivate them unless you can provide these other kinds of factors here. And, and, and there is causally a huge relationship between both of these factors as organizations look to build trust in a motivating work environment. So anyway, that comes to the end of this chapter, and uh, I hope that you found this helpful and useful. Thank you.